Dr. Chen is consultant in anesthesiology and director of the pain medicine unit of the Prince of Wales Hospital. He's also the supervisor of training in anesthesia in the New Territories East Cluster of the XJ Hospitals, as well as the Honorary Secretary of the Hong Kong College of Anesthesia. Uh, anesthesia. Uh, with his ample professional experience, as well as experience in teaching and training junior anesthetists, um, he's the most ideal person to talk on today's topic um, entitled Problems and Exception to Informed Consent. Dr. Chen, please. Thank you, Professor, for the kind introduction. And on preparing this talk, I have tried to get over with Professor Philip Jiu uh, to talk up in order to avoid overlap because we are in the same section. And uh, I just get him the, at the breakfast this morning about this, the same question. And what he said was, oh, Simon, being at the initiatives, you will have an opposite view anyway. <laughs> and I think he's quite right because what I'm going to talk about is the informed consent in relation to the problems and the exceptions. Um, has been uh, uh, discussed by the uh, last two speakers about the informed consent. Basically, it's a, it's a permission for something to happen or agreement to do something. Whereas for the medical informed consent, it was a permission granted in the knowledge of consequence. And the main ethical principle underlying the consent is autonomy. Now, for autonomy, it is uh, so-called defined as the freedom from external control or influence and self-governance. And it's a concept found in moral, political, and bioethical philosophy. Now, for a rational individual, the capacity to make an informed, uncoerced decision. Now, you may ask, is autonomy absolute? Now, obviously, it would not be because like an individual, if I want to exercise my autonomy, I would try to grab somebody's bank account money. Okay, I can grab his bag. Can you do so? Obviously you can't because your absolute autonomy would invade to somebody else's freedom. So, you know, that's why in, as a society that we have a, um, formed a, a designated rules and laws to create a fair way of living. And that's why for informed consent for medical intervention or invasive treatment, there is a, a become a legal requirement. In UK, which uh, the Hong Kong's a lot of regulation and laws are based on, uh, uh, the GMC in UK has uh, issued a, uh, a guidelines on how to uh, get the consent from the patients uh, between the doctors and the patients and trying to make a decision together. Whereas in Hong Kong, the medical uh, uh, consent is start, laid down as a code of professional conduct by the medical councils. Now, I, don't go, I would not go for the, uh, the informed consent uh, uh, laid out by the medical council of Hong Kong, but rather I would go through some of the exceptions. Now, as the uh, on informed consent is not absolute, just like the autonomy, there is a few procedures which we claim that uh, by the uh, hospital authority that can be exempted for written consent. When I look up this, I was shocked to find out that quite a few procedures that I would routinely get a consent for the patient that a consent is not necessary. Simple things like the blood taking, putting an IV line or IV injection of a particular drugs that a consent is not needed. A central line, including either an internal jugular or subclavian. Now, for those who are not sure what, but what is subclavian line, meaning that it was a near the chest, and you would have a one to, well, one percent chance of getting a pneumothorax. In other words, the needle would hit the lung. But under the HA guidelines, that putting a central line, even with a subclavian approach, that a consent is not needed. Um, other things like uh, more invasive, like the uh, putting a nasogastric tube or a urinary catheter. 
Now, all this thing, a written content is not read. In pediatric patient, a super, pu super pubic tapping, meaning that you stick a needle into a neonate in order to get some urine from the bladder. A joint aspiration or protoscopy. Protoscopy meaning that they put in a, a hard met metallic tube down to the bottom and look up to the rectum. Now, all this seemingly very invasive, a written consent form is not needed. But having said that, I think an oral consent form might be uh, really advisable. Other category that, that uh, the, uh, would become an exception would be the emergency treatment. Now, emergency situation, physicians should provide treatment that is both urgent and necessary and is the best interest of patient, provided that there is no clear advance refusal. Now, for unconscious patient that we may probably should discuss with the patient's family or close friend on the view of the proposed treatment when the patient is competent. In other words, when you discuss with your family, with the family or the close friend, you're trying to uh, align that whether the patient, when they're competent, whether it is, is, is best interest, and then whether the, uh, he would accept or refuse the proposed treatment. Now, this is um, uh, a, uh, a guideline that uh, push out about when you have a um, mentally incapacitated patient and undergoing an emergency uh, requiring emergency treatment, what do you do? Now, basically, when you, if you, uh, a patient is unconscious, oops, sorry. <clears throat> if a patient is unconscious, then you should go for the uh, common law and see whether the, whether the procedure is life-saving or not. And, and then you follow by the second doctor's opinions to the urgency. In other words, you need a two ammo consent form in the most of the X-ray hospitals. If the patient is uh, conscious but incapable to give consent, you do the same thing. Now, if the patient is, con uh, is conscious and uh, not a uh, mentally incapacitated patient, then again, you should go through the, uh, the common procedures uh, uh, getting the consent from the patient. Now, if the patient is conscious and known to be or suspected, suspected to be a mentally incapacitated patient, then you should go uh, through the algorithm uh, to the uh, mental health uh, ordinance, which I shall come back to it in a minute. Now, there's also some other treatments that were against patients' will. Uh, the main thing is you are trying to protect the, uh, the public. Uh, in situations like have, uh, infectious disease, uh, requiring infection control, and even uh, some confidentiality. Now, according to the chapter 599 of the uh, Ordinance of Control of Disease, um, that there is a 49 statutory notable diseases that we have to uh, inform the authority. Uh, uh, in conditions such as the TB, the Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome, or this uh, CJD. Now, patients who were found to have some uh, communicable disease has to undergo some mandate treatment, even against the patient's will. Um, there is some also anomalous reporting of the HIV AIDS uh, by the physician. In other words, if you find a patient who is HIV, then you should inform the authority uh, bef bef well, without disclosing the patient's identity. Other exceptions including the research without consent. Now, situation where consent is difficult or impossible to obtain, such as in unconscious patient, patient is in shock, unable to give consent, or study with a very short therapeutic windows. Now, all this situation that it would be difficult to get a consent uh, and may uh, infringe the right of autonomy. But on the other hand, the whole society will be benefit. Now, based on this type of argument, the U European Union would allow such study to recruit patients without the consent under a very strict regulation. Now, obviously, they have to apply to their uh, local respective uh, 
uh, research every committee. Now, there is informed consent. There's a lot more issues, but what I'm trying to do is, you know, we're going to go through some of the um, other issues. Now, the exception that I just went through with you are uh, very clear cut, laid down by law. The next few issues are less clear cut and a lot of, you know, uh, deserve discussion, such as uh, the, the consent for minor, uh, mentally incapacitated patient, uh, person, advanced directive, rights to refusal or demand treatment. There's, again, some other um, amount of information uh, to provide. Now, for treatment for uh, children, in UK, they agreed it or uh, by law uh, to give the consent is the patient of age of 16. Because in UK, age of 16 are considered to be adult and would be able or uh, to give the consent for any treatment. Whereas in Hong Kong, because our children is less mature, <laughs> that the legal age to give a valid consent in Hong Kong is 18. Now again, this is the guilty competence. The principle of guilty competence has to be uh, put in force. Uh, even though, in other words, you were trying to make sure that the, the, the children or child were a, uh, able to understand all the consequences and also the uh, material behind the treatment and also diagnosis in order to give a valid consent. Uh, the, uh, the blue paragraph that, uh, had, uh, right down here is uh, directly quote from the Medical Council. When it comes to a patient who is probably not competent, in other words, they might not be able to give, a, uh, you know, have not mentally sound enough to give a, a consent form, that we should have a going, undergoing some sort of assessment of the competence. And uh, Dr. Wong uh, has published uh, at the Hong Kong Medical Journal a few years back on a practical guide to uh, how to assess the, comp the capacity of whether the patient is uh, able to give a, a, a valid consent in Hong Kong. Now, basically, we would have to find out from the patient whether he or she is able to understand and retain the information, whether uh, he or she is capable to use the information and weight it in the balance and is able to have a degree of uh, commensurate with the gravity of the decision, decision in questions, and also whether it's capable to communicate a decision. Now again, there is some algorithm uh, in order to help the clinician or physician uh, attend the patient of what to do. Now I don't think I would go through that in detail, but uh, I've I'm sure it will be able to, you will be able to find out in a lot of the websites and all the other information. What I'm trying to get is, when you got a patient who is uh, found out to be incapable to make a consent form, and this, it is an elective treatment, what do you do? No. For an MIP patient who is unable to give a consent form, <clears throat> that we should, uh, there should be a two doctors again to sign it to, um, in order to justify that this is a, a necessary treatment and is the best interest of the patient. And then if you are still in doubt that uh, you should apply to the guardianship board in order to get a guardianship if the patient do not have any uh, guardian uh, allocated to the particular patient. And for the clinician or physician, that you should go to, uh, to the uh, guardianship board in order to have a more clear guidelines on this. Now, all this information seems to be quite clear cut, but I'd just like to highlight an example that there is still some, ambi uh, some ambi ambiguous about all these guidelines. For example, a depressed patient who took an overdose of the ANSET, uh, which is an uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. Now, this patient can be deter 
detained in the hospital for treatment for his depression uh, based on the mental health ordinance, uh, chapter 136, S26. However, if the same patient develops severe gastric bleeding from the overdose, he is competent enough to refuse a life-saving endoscopy and blood transfusion. So, in other words, although all these guidelines and laws, regulations are laid down, but when we apply it into as a frontline staff, there is still some dilemma that we have to able, we were not able to overcome this. Now, another issue about uh, the informed consent is the advanced directive. Now, this advanced directive, um, it happened uh, in 2005, uh, first of all, in UK, and then it is starting to appear in Hong Kong in 2009 or 2010. Now, it's based on the phenomenon that when an adult becomes incompetent, he will lose the rights to decide on his medical care. Basically, if a patient who was known to have a dementia, that he would become unable to decide what to refuse or what to receive for his treatment. That's one of the reasons why in UK that um, pe people who are seen seemingly going to become dementia are unable to make the decision. When he is able to make the decision, he would uh, sign up uh, around directive and refuse a particular treatment. So I think like, just like the do not resuscitate is uh, probably one of the uh, most quoted examples. Now there is also patient can have a right to refuse or, de um, or demand treatment. I think patients have a right to refuse treatment is well clear cut. But on the other hand, the patient is also deprived from having the right to have the demand of treatment. Now that comes to a particular case that was done uh, in 2008, uh, whereas in UK, a particular patient, uh, Burke, who suffered from a cerebellar ataxia. Now this particular condition is a continuous uh, degeneration of the uh, central nervous system, that the patient uh, will increasingly becoming lost is sort of swallowing reflexes and also all the motor uh, re uh, response. But the patient will become, uh, well, uh, become uh, very sound mentally. And this particular gentleman, Mr. Burke, that he was feared that by the time he was not able to swallow, that he would not be able to receive the necessary treatment to maintain his life. So that's why he applied to the court that to challenge the GMC, that uh, GMC has a regulation that you cannot choose your treatment. So he challenged this particular view to GMC and, uh, and requesting for that at the time is necessary that he would continue to receive the artificial nutrition and hydration when he lost his ability to swallow. Now, the initial ruling uh, by the court was that in, in favor of the, uh, Mr. Burke. But however, the GMC took this uh, into the court of appeal and overruled, uh, overturned this ruling. Now, this particular uh, case has indeed have some implication to the physicians that we're still able to advise for the treatment, uh, but the patient cannot demand for a particular uh, treatment. Now, there's also some other informed consent uh, about this, what sort of amount of information that we should provide to the patient. Now, one of the, I just quote down here that the explanation should be given in clear, simple, and consistent language. Explanation should be given in terms which the patient can understand. It is the doctor's duty to ensure that the patient truly understand the explanation by being careful uh, and patient. Now, all this seems to be very clear, but again, when you talk to your patient, how do you know whether the patient, what information is needed, whether, how much he will understand and able to retain? One of the main uh, the studies done uh, before and found that only 20% of the vital information were retained in a capsule endoscopy study. And of these patients, well, I would say patients are subjects, they are 90% are university educated and 20% are medical students. Now all these subjects are intellectually sound, well-educated, but only 20% of them were able to retain the information. In other words, how much information you give, 
how much information they're going to be able to retain. We may have questions. Now, one other important message is, in, out of this study, it was found that uh, only additional time spent in one-to-one -one interview will significantly improve the understanding and recall of information. Now, all the other, uh, like the pamphlets, video, would probably be not as helpful as a one-to-one -one, uh, interview. Now, in summary, I have the group, uh, went through a view about the exception for uh, informed consent, and the legal age to consent in Hong Kong is 18. Now, MIP for non-urgent treatment would need to observe the Part 4C of the mental health ordinance. Advanced directive is increasingly common in Hong Kong. Now, competent adult patients have right to refuse, but not to demand treatment. It remains the clinical uh, clinician's judgment on the amount of information provided when obtaining informed consent, but additional time in interview will improve understanding and recall of information. Now, I know that Professor Philip Jiu has used the same cartoon. The reason why we use the same cartoon, well, illustrate that, that at least we have something in common. Thank you.